Well, yeah. we're going to turn the page to our final topic here, and we want to turn to Latin America, some very interesting developments. And we are very, very honored to be joined once again by Mr. Ben Norton, who's a journalist and the editor of the Geopolitical Economy Report that you all should be following. Ben, thanks so much for being with us. It's always a pleasure being here on my favorite show. Thanks for having me. Oh, well, believe me, I am deeply honored to hear that. And you know what brings us here today, Ben, is the the SALAC meeting that just wrapped up, I guess it was, in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, you know, maybe for those of us who follow this closely, we know a lot about that. But uh, maybe say a little about what SALAC is and why this meeting was was so widely looked at by media from around the world. CELAC has quickly become one of the most important multilateral organizations in the world, and especially in Latin America and the Caribbean. It was founded as an alternative to the Organization of American States, the OAS. People might know that the OAS was deeply involved in the coup in Bolivia in 2019, spreading completely false claims in alliance with the Trump administration in order to justify a violent coup against the elected socialist president of Bolivia, Evo Morales. That did severe damage to the OAS's credibility, but the CELAC was actually created even before that because it was recognized going back decades that the OAS was, in the words of Cuba, the Yankee Ministry of the Colonies. That's what they called it. Across Latin America, it was recognized that the OAS was a tool of U.S. power. In fact, the OAS was created right at the beginning of the first Cold War. It was actually created a year before even NATO was created. And it was a coalition of right-wing anti-communist governments in Latin America. One of the founding members of the OAS was the uh, Somoza dictatorship in Nicaragua that the Sandinistas overthrew. So the OAS has always been based in Washington, funded by the U.S., a tool of Washington. So CELAC was created by leftist governments in Latin America a decade ago as a tool of regional integration that excludes the U.S. and Canada. So it includes all governments in uh, the Americas from Mexico to the bottom of Argentina, and it includes the, the members of the Caribbean as well. So this is a very important regional organization. They also held a meeting um, last year in Mexico City, but this meeting was extremely important because now the largest country in Latin America, Brazil, is once again a member. Jaro Bolsonaro, when he came to power, thanks to US-backed coups in, in Brazil, he withdrew Brazil from the CELAC as an attempt to try to sabotage this institution. And that did a lot of damage to it because Brazil is the largest country in Latin America with the largest economy. Lula da Silva has now come back. And this was his first foreign trip abroad since coming to power on January 1st. And not only did he um, talk about the importance of regional integration, but he also used the CELAC to announce that Brazil and Argentina are working on creating a new currency for Latin America to end their dependency on the U.S. dollar, as he said. That, I mean, I, that's a really big deal. That's very significant, what you just uh, said, This, this, these plans for a new currency to trade in Latin America. Can you talk a bit about uh, more about that and just why it's so significant? I mean, we're talking about Brazil is a massive country. Um, Argentina isn't small either, uh, but also one of the biggest countries in the hemisphere taking the lead on this. Yeah, Brazil is the sixth most populous country on Earth. It used to have the sixth biggest economy on Earth, or at least according to nominative GDP, me um, nominative GDP measurements. But uh, unfortunately, um, the uh, Bolsonaro administration helped destroy uh, Brazil's economy through neoliberal economic policies. It's no longer the sixth largest in nominal GDP terms. But um, Brazil is a co-founder of the BRIC system, of the B in BRIC stands for Brazil. And let's not forget that Lula da Silva himself was um, one of the masterminds behind the BRIC system. And uh, now we see that Brazil is playing a huge role in pushing regional integration in Latin America, a region where uh, the vast majority of trade is still done in the U.S. dollar. According to the U.S. Federal Reserve, 96% of trade in the Americas is invoiced in U.S. dollars. Now, um, the U.S. represents the majority of that trade, but still, the vast majority of trade in Latin America, including between countries not that aren't the U.S., involves dollars. So if Brazil and Argentina, if Brazil wants to sell oil to Argentina and Argentina wants to sell wheat or, or soy to Brazil, they usually do that trade in dollars, which doesn't make any sense because every time a country exchanges their currency 
four dollars, it actually reduces their own the value of their own currency against the dollar and helps to strengthen the dollar. So countries around the region and around the world are saying, why do we keep doing this? All we're doing is helping to to strengthen U.S. financial hegemony and maintain the dollar as this weapon that the U.S. can use to impose sanctions on countries, to lock them out of financial systems with sanctions and blockades. So what they're trying to do now is develop a regional currency that would be used as a unit of account. Now, really briefly, I don't want to get into the complicated details, but this is different from the euro in Europe and that, in, a, in a good way because the eurozone was designed by neoliberal economists. And basically in Europe, it's impossible for member states to run deficits that are more than 3% of GDP, which means that a country like Greece, even though the people of Greece elected a leftist party, Syriza, that party was not able to implement any of the leftist economic policies it wanted to implement because it has no sovereign monetary policy because Greece can't print euros. Only the European Central Bank based in Germany can print euros and it can't run a, def a deficit more than 3% of GDP, which means that Greece is permanently stuck in austerity policies and neoliberal policies. In Latin America, the economists helping to do research to create this new currency are leftists. They're studying you know, different models around the world. They understand what they should be avoiding. So instead, this currency is based on the model that was proposed by John Maynard Keynes, the famous British economist and the protectionist economist back in uh, the Bretton Woods conference in 1944. He called it the Bancor. Basically, what it means is that countries can do trade with each other with this currency, but it will be a unit of account so they can still maintain their domestic currency. So this is a way for countries in Latin America to get off of the U.S. dollar. That's what Lula said. It's to end the dependence on the U.S. dollar and what he didn't say, but what everyone knows. It's a way to prevent the United States from locking countries in Latin America out of the international financial system because everyone in Latin America can see what the U.S. and Europe did to Venezuela. They imposed brutal illegal sanctions that violate international law and they stole the Venezuelan central bank's foreign exchange reserves, including over a billion dollars worth of gold located in the Bank of England. And then the U.S. also did the exact same thing to Afghanistan. And then the U.S. did the same to Russia. The U.S. and the EU seized $300 billion of the Russian central bank's foreign exchange reserves. Countries around the world said, wow, this means that the U.S. is a basically an international pirate. They can steal our government's exchange reserves. We need to find new ways to protect our trade and protect our exchange reserves. And one of the ways of doing that is creating these new systems of trade and these new systems of holding reserves. So basically, the U.S. has caused severe blowback because of its own economic warfare policies against Venezuela, against Russia, against Iran and countries around the world. But especially in Latin America are taking the charge to try to create new economic alternatives to prevent the U.S. from being able to do that to them. You know, Ben, these are such important points on on a number of different levels. And, you know, one of the things that I think is important really here that you've raised is, you know, what it means for Lula to come back in terms of Brazil's place in the world. And, you know, there's there are some misguided people out there who, you know, have seen that since Lula has made statements on the war in Ukraine that are, you know, more or less the same as the government of China, um, that somehow he's less committed to taking on the existing order of imperialism than Bolsonaro, who, you know, three months left in his government went to Russia one time. Uh, and I just wonder how you respond to that, because I think obviously there are a lot of people who are, you know, hoping to see more from Brazil in terms of shifting the balance uh, in the global uh, relationship of forces. I mean, this is completely ridiculous. It, it, it almost isn't even worth responding to this ridiculous concept that Bolsonaro in any way was like challenging the U.S. Bolsonaro was the most pro-U.S., sycophantic pro-U.S. Brazilian leader since the dictatorship that was installed after a U.S.-backed coup in Brazil. I mean, let's not forget, Bolsonaro only came to power because of two U.S.-backed coups in Brazil. The 2016 impeachment of Dilma Rousseff of the Workers' Party, the president, on completely bogus charges, and Lula has referred to that this week as a coup, which is what it was. In 2018, then Lula was imprisoned on fake charges. The UN Human Rights Committee said that the charges against him were bogus and violated his civil and political rights. 
the Brazilian Supreme Court expunged his record and dropped all the charges against him. And the judge who oversaw the imprisonment of Lula in 2018 in the lead up to the elections was Sergio Moro, a longtime U.S. asset who was trained by the Justice Department. And after he imprisoned Lula, he was rewarded by becoming Bolsonaro's justice minister. And then Bolsonaro and Sergio Moro, they went to Virginia and they visited CIA headquarters. So Bolsonaro quite literally went to go and visit the CIA to thank them for imprisoning Lula. Anyone claiming that Bolsonaro was like independent or anti-imperialist is, I mean, I want to know what drug they're on, frankly. And furthermore, let's not forget, Bolsonaro constantly gave political rallies in Brazil with three flags, the Brazilian flag, the Israeli flag, and the U.S. flag. This is someone, this is a president of a country who gave rallies with other countries' flags. I've never heard of that happening in my life. And again, the idea that he was independent, I mean, Bolsonaro did everything he could to try to sabotage Latin American institutions of regional integration, like the CELAC, like Mercosur, like UNASUR. Lula is one of the co-founders of those institutions of regional integration. He wants Latin America to unite as a bloc in a multipolar world. He wrote an article calling for a multipolar world, but he doesn't just mean the US and China and Russia and India. He means Latin America and the Caribbean is a pole in that multipolar world. He wants Latin America to be a significant force in international affairs. He wants UNASUR to have um, uh, involvement in the G20, like the African Union. He wants Brazil to be a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Lula is not simply just a leftist leader. He is a leftist leader with international ambitions. I see him as someone like Nehru in India or, you know, um, Sukarno in mm. Indonesia. He wants to build a new non-aligned movement. And that's what he's doing. He was a co-founder of the BRICS. The BRICS is now expanding. Argentina has joined, has applied, excuse me, has applied to join BRICS. And China invited Argentina in 2022 to virtually assist the BRICS summit meetings. So what we're seeing is that Lula, under his leadership and other leftist leaders in Latin America, recognize that not only do they want to free themselves from US neocolonialism, they want to assert the voice of Latin America and the Caribbean on the international stage. And as one of the most progressive voices in the world, a region where most of the governments have left-wing leaders and a region where uh, increasingly, they're trying to build new forms of alternatives to neoliberalism. Lula, in his in his first speech as president inauguration, he called for fighting poverty and hunger, for renationalization of resources and state-owned companies and state-owned banks. And we see across Latin America and the Caribbean an attempt to build what they call 21st century socialism. And and I really think that Latin America is really at the vanguard of this international struggle against imperialism and against neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that all raises a really good point about the theme of this entire episode, which is the issue of this rising multipolar world. And I'm just curious, Ben, you know, with the rise of China and then, of course, even other states that are more increasingly willing to, you know, stand up to the United States or have already been standing up to the United States that are smaller countries like Iran and, and their role in giving Latin American countries a bit more breathing room. Uh, in, in a time like this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, more and more when we're talking about this new multipolar world, I think another way to think about it is also that the, where the, the process of decolonization is continuing and in some ways maybe even being completed because Nkrumah, the, the great Ghanaian revolutionary leader, famously wrote, you know, especially after the 60, 1966 U.S.-backed coup against him, that the process of political independence from colonialism was not complete, that there was neo-colonialism because these countries did not have their economic independence. And, you know, Ghana is an example in Western Africa. These are countries where their, their currency is still dominated by France through the CFA franc, and they have to keep half of their, their central bank's foreign exchange reserves in Paris. So the process of economic decolonization is what we're seeing. And we see maybe like regions of the world like uh, Southeast Asia with institutions like ASEAN, and increasingly East Asia, I mean, not, not South Korea and Japan, which are unfortunately still militarily occupied by the US, but China, 
Um, and even India, to an extent, I mean, the Indian government is pretty reprehensible, but India as a significant power in the world, I mean, 1.4 billion people, you can't reduce everyone in India just to their leader, right? What we're seeing is that these countries economically have been able to develop enough that they can exercise some kind of sovereignty and independence, and they're building institutions to, to create a non-aligned movement in this kind of new Cold War. The BRICS is one of them, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. But we also see the same thing in other regions. I mentioned ASEAN in Southeast Asia, the African Union and attempts to build regional integration there, and Latin America. I mean, like I said, I want to stress this point again, that when we're talking about a multipolar world, sometimes people will get caught up in just the fact that, you know, the, the rise of China as the largest economy in the world, according to purchasing power parity, or the rise of Russia again after, you know, the neoliberal shock therapy imposed on Russia in the 1990s. Those are all part of the story. But another huge part of the story is the rise of multiple countries in Africa asserting their sovereignty with economic development, Ethiopia becoming a very significant power, South Africa, but also Latin America. I mean, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, these are very big countries. They have large developing economies and other countries in the region as well. I mean, uh, Colombia, Venezuela, like ar across Latin America and the Caribbean, there is a lot of potential being recognized by these leaders. They have all the natural resources they need to develop and if they can unite their forces, they can become a significant pole in that multipolar world. The, the, of course, danger is as the, uh, the U.S. commander of, of um, Southcom, which is the U.S. military section that oversees Latin America and the Caribbean, um, she gave a speech at the Atlantic Council, Laura Richardson, in which she salivated over the natural resources in Latin America, over the lithium and copper and oil and water resources, and she said that, you know, the U.S. wants to make sure it has access to those resources. So that's the danger is that this rise of these powers in this new multipolar world that are trying to challenge neocolonialism. Unfortunately, it's not inevitable that, that, that they will be victorious. So that's why I think it's so important to talk about the ways in which the U.S. is trying to frustrate these attempts at decolonization, whether it's through the rise of Latin America and regional integration, the U.S. attempts to sabotage groups like the Bolivarian Alliance, the ALBA, or the CELAC, or UNASUR, or the attempts to sabotage Eurasian integration, which is basically part of the same struggle. It's about dividing these regions of the world and keeping them divided in order, in order to maintain imperial hegemony. Mm -hmm. Well, Ben, before we let you go, where can people find your work? People can go to geopoliticaleconomy.com. Everything I talked about today is the stuff I report on and especially about the different projects of Latin American integration and Eurasian integration and how it all plays together. Mm -hmm. In English and in Spanish, by the way. Yeah. Ben Norton, as always, really an honor to be joined by you here. It's a real pleasure. Thanks, Eugene and Rania. Keep up the awesome work. Mm-hmm.